Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining today. I'm Andy Shoemaker, the founder of Nimbus DDoS, and today I'm going to perform a live DDoS attack scenario against an API endpoint and talk a little bit about the challenges in securing APIs against DDoS attacks. Uh, now before we start, I'd like to give you a little background on myself and Nimbus DDoS. So prior to founding Nimbus DDoS in 2013, I'd spent the last 15 years in the operations world, uh, primarily focused on massive scale consumer websites. As you might imagine from my list of past gigs, uh, many of these were frequent targets of DDoS attacks, uh, notably TripAdvisor.com and the online casino and poker company. Uh, I've also had a personal interest in DDoS attacks dating back to about 1995 when I first encountered the source code for a SIN flood attack on a security mailing list. Uh, please take note of my contact information and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about this presentation or DDoS attacks. Uh, also, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you use that platform. Uh, as for my company, uh, Nimbus DDoS is the industry leader in vendor-neutral DDoS attack preparedness services. Uh, our vision is to provide the highest level of DDoS expertise to help our customers achieve the level of DDoS preparedness that their business demands. Uh, the foundation of our platform is the expertise of our DDoS engineers, uh, all of which have found uh, all of which have firsthand experience with DDoS attacks. Uh, additionally, all of our engineers have experience crafting DDoS source codes uh, uh, in much the same way as a real attacker. Uh, upon this foundation, we've built a handful of services uh, that are shown on this slide. Uh, the first is our DDoS risk assessment, uh, which is a DDoS-specific non-intrusive reconnaissance of an environment, and it's intended to find the weaknesses before an attacker does. Uh, this is often the first step for most organizations in their path to DDoS preparedness. Uh, the risk assessment is then usually paired with our proprietary testing platform that allows us to launch legal and legitimate real-world DDoS attacks uh, against an environment in a controlled manner. Uh, that's an important part. Uh, our platform can do any of the attacks that are currently seen in the wild, including those of the Mirai botnet. Um, you know, we can launch attacks ranging in size from one megabit per second uh, up to well over 100 gigabits per second. Um, in fact, we actually did a uh, 100, gigabit, uh, 100 gigabit per second attack a month ago to help a small country uh, test their defenses. Uh, another service we offer are war game or red team scenarios. Uh, these are designed to test response procedures of the operations teams. Uh, Nimbus TDOS engineers will try to challenge the defenders with surprise attacks and dynamic attack vectors intended to push the response teams uh, to their limit. Uh, rounding out our preparedness package, we also offer formal DDoS training that can be customized for both technical and non-technical audiences. Uh, and lastly, lastly, we offer the industry's first and only DDoS preparedness certification. Uh, this is a certification framework created by Nimbus DDoS to help companies evaluate their vendors and their partners or provide a method uh, for them to communicate their own preparedness status to their customers and partners. Uh, of course, if you'd like to hear more details on any of these offerings, uh, please feel free to contact me. Now, with all of that sales stuff out of the way, uh, let's dig into the technical stuff. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to provide a little background on common API design. So API architecture could take many forms. Uh, this slide shows a common approach uh, that, that's often seen. Uh, here we see a mobile application that makes API calls to an API gateway. Uh, an API gateway, for those that are unfamiliar, is simply an HTTPS endpoint that directs traffic uh, and requests to the appropriate underlying resource. Uh, it may have additional functionality to assist in the administration of the API, but it's fundamentally just a web proxy. Uh, the software that's uh, used for API gateways can vary. It could be an open source software, such as Nginx running Kong, or it might be a commercial product uh, or a service like AP, uh, such as Apigee or Amazon's API Gateway. <clears throat> uh, as we can see in the diagram, the API Gateway directs various requests to the underlying application servers, usually based upon a path. Uh, for example, uh, slash login over on the left is being directed to the app server cluster on the left and its associated database, but slash search is going to the cluster of resources on the right. Uh, now looking at this, it doesn't seem that it's that different from a traditional website that, has, that a browser might access. 
So let's take a look at those side by side to see how they compare. So they're very similar, right? <laughs> so instead of a custom mobile application, um, you know, we have a common web browser instead. But we still might have some edge proxies that act similar to the API gateway, uh, directing traffic uh, to the right areas of the infrastructure and providing some centralized management functions. Uh, so what does this difference actually mean? Uh, the first major difference is that our API client is a highly specialized um, piece of software compared to a typical web browser. Uh, and this directly leads to the second key difference, which is that, AP, is that the API clients often don't support the same features and functionalities as a full browser. Uh, a great example of this is JavaScript. If an API client receives a JavaScript response, um, it probably won't know what to do with it unless the application has explicit support added. Uh, and this is going to be important later on in this, in this, uh, in this recording, so please take note of that. Uh, the next big difference is that APIs are a programmatic interface where application servers are communicated, uh, communicating with each other in an agreed upon proprietary, you know, quote unquote language that's usually developed internally in an organization. Uh, you know, and this differs from the web where organizations like the W3C and so forth are setting global standards for interaction. So let's switch gears a moment. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, DDoS attacks, and then we're going to circle back so that you can understand how mitigation all fits into this whole thing. Uh, so the type of attack that most people are familiar with is the volumetric attack. Uh, these are the attacks that we often hear about in the news because the numbers being tossed around make for really great headlines. Uh, so these attacks are also some of the simplest, and you know many of them have been around for over 20 years. Uh, in essence, this attack takes advantage of the fact that most organizations have a fixed and finite amount of network bandwidth. And so by filling that pipe, uh, no legitimate traffic can pass through. Uh, you know, these attacks can consist of really any type of traffic, and, you know, it's generally spoofed traffic, making it hard to identify this, the real source. Uh, an important point to note about this is that to protect an environment, the bad traffic must be blocked upstream before it fills the network circuit. So up here. Uh, so this next slide, uh, this shows a SYN flood, which is a type of protocol attack. Uh, in essence, a protocol attack takes advantage of some weakness in a network protocol to exhaust memory, CPU, or some similar limited resource on the target. Uh, unlike the volumetric attack, these attacks can often be more challenging to detect, and this is primarily due to the lower, uh, the lower volume of traffic that's involved. Uh, you know, these attacks are often misdiagnosed as, you know, buggy network hardware, and it's only identified through closer scrutiny by someone that's familiar with DDoS attacks, you know, by looking at, you know, things like packet captures. Uh, the last group of attacks are so-called Layer 7 or application attacks. Uh, these are attacks where seemingly legitimate requests are sent to the target at a really high rate. Uh, the simplest type of attack is shown here, an HTTP request flood. Uh, in this, the attacker simply bombards the target website with more requests than it's capable of serving. So by doing so, legitimate users of the website can't access the site. Uh, you know, these types of attacks take many forms, but the key is that they attempt to appear legitimate. In fact, in a theoretically perfect attack, they would be uh, effectively indistinguishable from real user traffic, making them very hard to detect. Um, so now that we have sort of a baseline of the different uh, attack categories and the different overall attack vector types. Let's talk about mitigation now. And again, this will all tie back to the API discussion in a moment. Uh, so this table is a summary of a small subset of the many uh, mitigation techniques that are available. And, you know, I do mean many. You know, there's probably hundreds of different approaches to mitigation that um, different vendors and, uh, and, and software makers have. Um, and these are really just uh, some of the most common ones that we see used by those vendors. And I'll run through these uh, really, really quickly. So the first one, uh, the discarding of irrelevant traffic is a pretty simple one. So let's say that you have an HTTPS endpoint that is receiving a ton of DNS responses. Um, now, since this traffic is unneeded by that endpoint, it can simply be discarded outright. 
So you can just block all DNS traffic because you don't care about it. Um, the next one on the list here, discarding of invalid traffic is very similar. Um, so with most protocols, there are specific standards for how the content of the packets is constructed. Um, it's not uncommon for attackers to develop their tools in a sloppy manner, or they might actually violate those standards as part of the actual attack um, to, to trigger some sort of uh, unusual behavior. Um, so for instance, let's say you have a stream of packets with invalid checksums. Again, that can be discarded completely because no legitimate client is going to be sending those uh, packets with that invalid checksum. Um, the next one is uh, discarding based upon an identifier or a fingerprint. Um, it's basically discovering and filtering based upon something that's unique to the attack. So for instance, maybe you have um, you know, an attacker that's doing an HTTP attack and they have some unique user agent uh, string that's unusual or unique to their attack. Um, you know, maybe their user agent string spells, you know, Firefox wrong. It says Firefax or something. <laughs> um, again, we can just discard those outright because it's very likely not a real client. Um, next, we have caching requests. It's uh, something that's normally specific to HTTP attacks, where a large proxy network like a CDN or something similar is able to absorb an attack by serving data directly rather than overwhelming the underlying application servers. Um, just a few more left. Um, so source IP rate limiting, um, that's probably pretty uh, uh, easy one to understand, but uh, you know, it's basically just setting some maximum values for traffic volume based upon the sender. So in essence, you're uh, identifying the heavy hitters on your network and you're limiting how much resources they can take. Uh, next, we have our JavaScript challenges, which um, these are specific to HTTP attacks, where a special JavaScript code is presented by an upstream proxy service uh, when an attack is suspected, and uh, only successful responders can then access the real resources. And then the very last one, we have uh, CAPTCHAs, which, you know, everyone knows what a CAPTCHA is, I think. Um, you know, it's just the annoying pop-ups that ask you to prove that you aren't a bot by you know, having you decipher some uh, you know, letters and numbers or something like that. Um, so earlier we talked about the differences between API clients uh, like a mobile application and a generic web browser. So what happens if we zoom in on this yellow column over here, because that's the one that we care about ma mainly, and look at the mitigation techniques available based on whether it's an API, brow API client or whether it's a browser. Uh, so we can see in the table that many of our mitigation techniques are no longer available. Uh, so let's go through each of these. So uh, you know, mitigation based on some uh, identifier, uh, that's still an option. So that is unchanged, but the issue there is that it depends on some identifier or attack signature existing, which isn't always the case in all DDoS attacks. Uh, but certainly if our API endpoint or a regular website is receiving requests with some unique characteristic, we still have that as an option for blocking. Uh, moving on, we see that caching is now off the table for API endpoints. Uh, and this is because API requests and responses are general, generally communicating data that shouldn't be cached or you know, explicitly can't be cached because it's real-time data. Uh, next, we have source IP rate limiting. Uh, this is still an option and still possible for both, uh, both endpoints. However, the problem we have is that source IP rate limiting is, in general, a poor method for detecting and mitigating Layer 7 attacks, since the amount of traffic is generally rather low and will often slip under uh, rate limit thresholds. Uh, and then lastly, we have the JavaScript challenge and the CAPTCHA, which are the two most frequently used mitigation techniques for Layer 7 attacks. Um, however, they end up being uh, completely useless in an API scenario. So even though they are the most common mitigations for layer seven um, that you'll see in most vendors, uh, they really just don't work for API scenarios. So in the case of the JavaScript challenge, it's really unlikely that the client application, so for instance, a mobile app or something like that, or an IoT device, uh, it's very unlikely that they will even have support for JavaScript. And even if it does, there's no guarantee 
that it will have the same feature set and support as the JavaScript capabilities of a full browser that are required by most mitigation vendors. Uh, and then of course in the case of a CAPTCHA, this is usually going to break the API outright because the CAPTCHA will be an unexpected response to our client application. And the application, unless specifically designed to display the CAPTCHA, will have no capability to even display it. Um, so at this point, I think you can all see that the specialized nature of API communication restricts mitigation tools uh, that can be used. Uh, now I want to show a real world attack uh, here uh, next to illustrate how easy it can be for an attacker to launch a layer seven attack against an environment. Uh, so for this scenario, we have our test company, Widgets LLC. Uh, there isn't anything too remarkable about them. They're just a mid-sized company that sells widgets, which are basically just a type of uh, Internet of Things appliance. You know, maybe it's a, you know, a IoT video camera or a, a thermostat or something like that. Uh, this IoT device communicates with the Widgets API server that's listed here on this uh, page. And if that communication fails, the device effectively stops working for that customer. So you know, maybe that online video camera now no longer works. Uh, their technology stack is also, also isn't terribly remarkable. Um, you know, they're hosted in Amazon Web Services and they have uh, application servers that auto scale to meet increasing load demands. In this particular case, uh, they have a weakness though, which is their single monolithic database that doesn't scale well. Now, to protect themselves against threats, our victim company has taken steps common in the industry, including running periodic vulnerability scans and having things like software patches and procedures and, and so forth in place. Uh, they've also set up some ingress packet filtering to block all traffic other than HTTPS, or, or rather HTTP for this test. Um, now let's meet our attacker. Uh, attackers can range in capabilities from a single lone wolf on one end of the spectrum to organized crime or even nations at the other end. Uh, in this example that we're doing today, our attacker is going to be one of those lone wolf uh, attackers, and he, he makes his money by extorting people and organizations with DDoS attacks, and he protects himself by using Bitcoin to hide the transfer of money. Uh, much like the widgets company, our attacker's capabilities are also fairly modest with a very small botnet of just five nodes. Uh, now with such a small botnet, he can only launch uh, small attacks of perhaps a few gigabits per second. Uh, so for our attacker to be effective, he'll need to find a particularly weak area to exploit. Uh, now with regard to size, uh, to get a sense of scale, consider that the Mirai botnet attacks in 2016 uh, launched DDoS attacks using around 500,000 nodes. So uh, significantly larger botnet. Uh, and in 2016, there was an attack that exceeded one terabit per second. Uh, now let's begin the attack. Okay, so before we start things, um, we have three different terminal windows that are going to show different areas. Uh, the top left one is our attack, uh, our attacker's attack nodes. Um, the top right is going to be uh, my local workstation here where we're just going to run some uh, performance tests from. Um, and then the bottom window is our target API server. Now before we launch the attack, let's review the current status of the target by running some commands from my local workstation. Uh, since this is an API, uh, the best way to do this is using the command line tool curl. Uh, you can use this uh, and you can see in this window my curl command, and you can see that we're targeting this URL. So it's uh, targeting the login endpoint for widgetsapi.nimbusddos.com. Um, you can see that we have a few different headers in here that are being supplied. Um, and then this piece here is the content of what we're sending the API server. So this is a JSON string um, that's uh, clearly attempting to do a login with uh, the username Andy test and then this uh, password uh, thrown in there. So if I run that, you can see that we get back a 200 response. 
and we also get a response back um, from our login. So this is a JSON response that's basically saying access denied because of course uh, I don't have a legitimate username and password. Now if we run this a few different times, you can see that the time that it takes is uh, pretty reasonable. I mean, it's a little bit slow, but not too bad. So 946 milliseconds, you know, we run that a few more times, 852 milliseconds, 986 milliseconds, 810 milliseconds, so forth. Uh, and if I switch down to this other window for my target server, um, let's take a look at the access logs for our API server. So I'm just going to tail that log. And if we run that same curl command again, you'll see that, you know, our requests pop up in there uh, without a problem. Um, and just as I mentioned before, you can see that the HTTP response code is a 200 indicating that there was a successful uh, request. So now, let me uh, cancel that. Let's switch up to our attacker window now. And let's go ahead and start our attack. So uh, we're actually on two nodes. We're not going to run it from the full botnet. We'll just run it from here. Um, and by the way, I'm going to mention that um, for this test, uh, since this is a uh, webinar sort of format, um, we're not using the the uh, Nimbus DDoS attack platform with all of its different bells and whistles. Um, we're tr we're keeping things a little bit simpler just to uh, sort of illustrate the point. So I'm doing doing things a little bit more old school um, behind the scenes here. Um, our attack platform actually has all sorts of extra features and all sorts of things. But um, you know, if you want to demo that, just uh, <laughs> again give me a shout. So anyway, let me start up the attacks. All right, so those should be started. Now, if I go back over to our target window down at the bottom, and we take a look at the access logs, let's just tail that again. And you can see that the requests are coming in, you know, they're coming in quick. <laughs> um, and if we take a look at a packet capture, so let's just grab, a, grab some packets here real quick. You can see that we have, um, just scroll through this and find a, so here, here's a response coming from the server um, back to our attacker. Um, but you can also see, we should be able to see some uh, requests going in as well. Let's find a few of those. Let me just do another quick capture here. Yeah, so here's actually right down here at the bottom. So this is a post of our attack attacker basically sending a whole bunch of uh, JSON uh, login attempts just over and over and over. So now with the attack underway, let's try to uh, load our site now again. So I'm going to go back up to my uh, local workstation up in the top right corner, and I'm just going to run that same curl command that we ran before. And yeah, that is taking much longer than 800 milliseconds that we saw before. So let's let that go for a little while, see if it spits back anything. Um, and what's interesting is we, we may end up actually getting responses. Um, they're going to be very, very slow, which, you know, of course, for a user of a mobile app, that's probably going to create some sort of unacceptable performance. So in this case, it took, uh, you know, 29 seconds for it to produce the, uh, the proper output. Um, and what we might end up uh, starting to see is we might start seeing some 500 responses, which are, um, you know, uh, error responses. So not even getting back a successful response from the server. But even the ones that are working fine, you know, are going to take a really long time. So let me just cancel that. So I just canceled it after 22 seconds of waiting. So now let's just jump back over to our target server and let's one more time just take a look at those uh, access logs. So I'm just going to look at the last uh, 50 entries in there. Um, and what we can see is, you know, we do still see entries showing up in here. Um, but if we look through here, what we'll probably start seeing, you know, it's, and it's going to be hit or miss. So that's why I'm running this a few different times. Like, yeah, here we go. So, you know, there we see a 500 error. There we see another 500 error. 
500, 500, you know, so 500 errors are popping up all over the place. So these are people whose requests are just outright failing. You know, it's not even timing out. It's, um, it's literally just producing an error. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, even these other clients, uh, these other requests that are generating a proper response, um, those are, um, you know, taking a very long time to produce that response, a uh, very likely an unacceptable one. So by all accounts, you know, this is a, a significant outage for our company. So uh, while this runs, uh, I do want to point out a few facts about the attack. Uh, so first, this attack is relatively small. Uh, if we had uh, network traffic graphs, uh, it's very likely we wouldn't notice anything unusual on them, or we may even see a decrease in traffic because the attack may be displacing legitimate traffic. So you might actually see a drop in traffic even though uh, you know, you're, you're experiencing a DDoS attack. Um, you know, this attack itself is only a couple thousand packets per second and uh, probably just a few megabits per second. Um, now, you know, this is partly because this is a demo, <laughs> but it's also very typical for layer 7 attacks, which usually will end up crushing the application servers before the network starts to feel any sort of strain. Uh, second, I do want to uh, point out to everyone uh, to take note of the relatively small size of our botnet. Uh, I only use two uh, botnet nodes today with uh, very modest resources. Now again, you know, this is a demo, so the target is also modest, uh, but the point is that history has shown that botnets can extend well over 100,000 nodes. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop our attack. All right, so that should be uh, winding down. Um, so with that shut down, I'm going to go one more time, uh, you know, back over here to my local workstation and run that same uh, test. And what we should see here is that the response times are going to uh, return back to normal, uh, and that the target will not instantly, but pretty quickly recover. So, nope. See, we're already down to uh, about a second. So, yep, things are, uh, things are looking good. 820 milliseconds, 980 milliseconds, you know, 816 milliseconds. Uh, so things are actually looking uh, much better. And this is pr uh, pretty common, this behavior. Um, in most cases, targets will immediately return to normal when the attack traffic stops. So, you know, what caused this behavior today? So in our demo environment today, the target site consisted of a large number of API servers behind a load balancer. Uh, these load balanced APIs have plenty of resources and could probably handle a ton more traffic than our attackers sent. But unfortunately for our victim company, the database was a bottleneck for this specific uh, request. So for each one of the login attempts, it's going to this authentication database, which is a you know Achilles heel of this environment. So what ended up happening is all the API servers became congested because the database response slowed down, um, basically causing back pressure on them. Um, so it caused, you know, as a result, it caused all the requests to fail, um, even if they didn't even use the database. Um, if you look at, uh, if you look at the load on the server, let's take a look at uptime here. You know, we can see that we have some pretty extreme loads on that server, and what that is is an indication that um, you had all those different uh, request threads that are queuing up, waiting on that. Uh, back-end database that was performing poorly. So, as you can see, uh, it's pretty simple for an attacker to launch a Layer 7 attack against an API. So, what can be done to protect these critical endpoints? So, let's go ahead and uh, switch back over to the slide deck. So, my first suggestion is to go through your environment and identify areas that do not horizontally scale and you know, try to change them so that they do. Now, of course, this isn't always possible. I mean, we all have legacy applications that we have to support. <laughs> uh, or you may not even know until you've been attacked that you have a bottleneck in your environment. Um, but it should be a design goal for any environment that you create. Uh, and of course, the testing that we do at Nimbus DDoS is great at finding these unknown bottlenecks. 
So, you know, of course, give me a call if you want some help on this one. Uh, next, uh, implement basic API rate limits. Uh, these won't protect you against a large attack, but they may help you against smaller attacks or a rogue client performing badly. Uh, another helpful item is to use um, to use what's called access tokens with each of your requests. Um, it's essentially a form of uh, authentication, if you will. Um, and if the and what what you do is if the request doesn't have a valid token, you drop that request with no action as quickly as possible. So you do that authentication extremely early in your in your uh, application pipeline. Uh, again. You know, this won't help you for the large-scale attacks as the simple act of dropping uh, the request when done, you know, hundreds of thousands of times per second uh, would be too much. Uh, and then similar to the access token, you can also use client-side SSL certificates to authenticate your clients. Uh, and this will allow you to drop invalid clients during the HTTPS negotiation before any requests are actually sent. Uh, and then much, however, much like uh, what I just mentioned for the last item, this isn't going to help you in a massive attack as the overhead of attempting to establish the SSL connections uh, very likely would be enough to degrade the environment. Uh, and then the last one <coughs> is to use uh, third-party DDoS mitigation. Uh, oops, I jumped ahead in the slide deck. <laughs> um, and the last one is basically to use third-party DDoS mitigation vendors. So um, there are third-party uh, cloud-based uh, as well as hardware-based vendors um, who provide tools that are meant to uh, specifically try to uh, detect and mitigate these types of attacks. However, it's important when selecting a vendor that you evaluate the vendor for your specific use case. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, some of the well-known mitigation techniques that are used by many of these vendors will not work for an for protecting an API uh, server. So if you have API servers that you want to protect, but your mitigation vendor only does CAPTCHA-based or JavaScript challenge-based mitigation, that's going to be a huge problem for you, and that vendor will not be an appropriate partner to work with. Um, so that is my presentation for today. So I'm just going to jump over to uh, my final slide here. Again, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for attending. Um, and by all means, again, feel free to give me a call, um, drop me an email, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and if you have any questions about this presentation or about uh, DDoS attacks, um, please you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to, uh, happy to assist you. Thank you.